and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hofdahl. And today we're talking about Final Destination. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, it sounds so scary and official when you say it like that. Meg, I read something really, really cool about this movie, and I don't know if you know this. Did you know that writers, when they're trying to break into the business, they'll write spec scripts, which is, you know, a script for a, an existing TV show and you write it as if it's going to be an episode. And this guy wrote this as a spec script for the X-Files. This was an X-Files episode. Oh, I think I did hear that, but I'm glad you reminded me because I did forget. That's really cool. And it's kind of crazy. <laughs> it makes me think of like fan fiction, like Fifty Shades yes. of Grey fan fiction turned into like Twilight or something. Yeah. Is that what happened? Um, so that's great. However, you use your creativity and it could totally. It was the other way away around though. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Wait, or was I... it? Wait, oh, you said Fifty Shades of Grey turned into oh. Twilight. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> it's all things that have happened. I don't know. But um, I, I could see it as an X-Files episode. I could. I know. So originally it was an X-Files episode. And then, who is it? Dar- not Darren Morgan, James Wong. Yeah. Whoever it was from Darren the X-Files, Glenn Morgan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, this is my life right now. <laughs> they liked it so much. They're like, no, 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 no. Let's make it a movie. And they did. Yeah. I So... I really, I kind of have like this fondness for this movie. It came out when I was 16 and I think I was the perfect age and it it had X-Files adjacent or I mean people who are, who write for the X-Files and were involved in it. Um, Kristen Cloak, who's in it, was in an episode of the X-Files. Not one of our favorites, but she was in it. Um, And also uh, growing up in Vancouver, um, where I grew up. Um, a place called Richmond, I was not too far from where Devin Sawa grew up. And so he was kind of considered the local boy that was acting. Um, Obviously, there are many actors up there. That's a big, huge place to make movies. But he was kind of the hometown boy. And so seeing Final Destination was kind of cool. I had already um, left uh, Canada by that point. But I I still recall I was on a trip with my parents and we like watched it on pay-per-view or something. And I don't know, I just... It's just a movie that I recall fondly. And, and also it's films where, you know, in, in Vancouver. And so it just, it has like a homey feeling to me. I love this movie. And I, like, I knew that I was going to pick it for the podcast. And then Campbell and I, like, watched all five movies over a weekend. And I don't regret anything <laughs> because it was great. Okay, so this first movie came out in the year 2000. It's only 34% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, which I don't think is fair. I think it's better than that. Uh, it had a budget of $23 million. It made $112.9 million at the box office. So, uh, you know, it definitely justified those sequels. Um, made a lot of money. But, you know, I think there were a lot of, like, high school movies coming out at that time. Like, you know, high school horror movies. I mean, aren't there always, I guess. But um, I think this one kind of stands above and has sort of, I don't know, found its place in the world. And I think a big part of that is it's not a slasher. It is a, it's a much higher concept and I don't know, like when I go about my daily life, I feel like I think about this movie more than I think about a lot of horror movies, you know? Yeah. And, and I, well, Campbell and I are going to talk about the other movies uh, after this, but we always say ever since that weekend, we're like, oh my God, this feels like a final destination moment. Like what's going to happen next? Cause we'll see something and it's like, what could happen in order like the dominoes falling in order for us to die right now it's dark but it's kind of funny it's like um not to get all emily dickinson up in here but there's the poem like i could not stop for death so death stop for me and it's sort of like it's like this idea that you're marked by death death is something that you can't escape which is true which makes all of this terrifying because the truth is we aren't nobody's getting out of this alive and the idea that you, if you miss your death, that it's going to come back around to you is such a fascinating concept. And I, I like that there's not like this, this slasher going around killing people, that this is, this is just death. And it's just, this is the universe, it's plan. And how do you, how do you fight against something like that? I love it. Uh, I think that the storytelling is so well paced and they set it they set up this story so nicely that you're on for the ride 
and all these little things happening like he's getting these little feelings and these for this foreshadowing but we don't really know why yet like we're we're feeling like nervous about the flight and stuff before anything happens before we actually see what he sees but the the performances are good too it's a really well made movie it is um there's something really natural about the acting and the the kids in the movie they feel I don't know they just feel real like they talk like real kids I mean obviously now this movie's almost 20 years old um but it, like I said for me it came out when I was 16 and it felt like more realistic the way they talked and acted to than other movies of that time of teenagers um You know, uh, speaking of Devin Sawa, you mentioned him being a hometown boy earlier. He had a tweet earlier this year. Uh, somebody was saying, like, your performance in Idle Hands is amazing. And he's and he responded saying who he studied, speaking of last week, was Bruce Campbell in Evil Dead 2. And, like, look at that comedic performance. Yes, that makes sense. We should do Idle Hands sometime. I haven't seen that since I was a kid, I don't think. Um What's Devin Sawa up to? I don't know. He tweets a lot. I follow him now because of that tweet. Oh. I was like, he was on my radar. No, he's great. He's got a lot of nice things to say. And speaking, since we're bringing it back around to Bruce Campbell, did you notice there's an actor in this movie and an actor that is in Bubba Hotep? Who is it? Um, and I know this because, because, um, and I think I've admitted this before, but when I was a kid, I was a Matlock groupie. I, I haven't that. heard you admit that before so really? must have been on your other podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I I absolutely loved Matt lived and breathed Matlock when I was like 9 10 11 years old um I would come home during lunch hour from school because I lived right across the street so I could watch Matlock while I ate my lunch that's normal right <laughs> um and there was an actor on that show named Daniel Roebuck who is in Bubba Hotep is one of the um uh, funeral dudes and he's in and when I saw him in Bubba Hotep I'm like Matlock and then he's also in Final Destination as one of the cops and he's also in Lost and he's also in Man in the High Castle oh is he oh good for him so now I remember <laughs> now that you mention it but yeah but we had just watched Final Destination we're like oh my god it's the guy so anyway he's he gets around he's busy yeah he's got credits so the first death um, after this vision of the of the plane exploding and everything, which is so well done, like seeing it in the background. Um, Todd dies by slipping on the water, getting wrapped up in the clothesline, and then the shampoo makes it slippery, so it looks like he hanged himself. And I just like how every single death scene, they set it up, and they do this throughout all five movies. They set up all of these possible ways to die in each scene, so the audience... We're going along cringing. We're like, is it going to be this? Is it going to be this? Is it going to be electricity and water? Is it going to be the razor? Is it going to be the scissors that they just showed? Like he's trimming his nose hairs. Mm -hmm. And we're so nervous. Like, is he going to fall and like the scissors are going to go up and pierce his brain? Like we don't know. And then when it finally gets him, it's like something maybe we saw or didn't. It's just we're waiting on the edge of our seats. Yeah, they do a really good job of creating dread and like showing you. And also it sort of makes you paranoid because you're like, there are a million ways to die, yeah. you know? So... Um, oh, I know what I was going to say before about <laughs> there, there are like these realistic teenagers. I don't know if I can go and get on a plane without thinking about the scene where he's like, we need to go try to poop before we go on the plane. <laughs> like I always think about that. <laughs> yes. That's great advice. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And then when they get on the plane and they're like, oh, it'd be really effed up God to yeah. take this plane down because there's a guy in a wheelchair and then there's like a baby and and it's like, oh, but guess what? It happens. Guess what? God is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> the second death. Oh, well, Tony Todd is in this movie. And oh, that's great. Yeah, that's right. Anytime we get a Tony Todd sighting, that's great. The second death is the bus hits the girl out of nowhere, which is great. And I, I was telling Campbell, I feel like this now has become a more common trope that we see. But I feel like this was unexpected when it happened in this movie at that time. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is the first movie that it ever happened in, but it did. It now does feel like it's a kind of an overused trope now. And when people are like backing up into the street, you're like, oh, okay, I see this coming. But I think at the time it didn't feel that way. The third death is the teacher. Um, this whole she's packing up the fire starts, the computer glass, 
uh, shoots out and slits her throat and then the knives fall on her. Yeah. That's so complicated and like brilliant. Yeah, it's almost like, is what is that? Mach- it's like a Goldberg. What is that machine? You know what I'm talking about? The kind that like, it's like a domino thing where like things, that's what I've always loved about um, um, Final Destination because they'll do that where it's like this hits this and then it hits that and then. And then she's laying there with the knives in her, and then the chair falls to get the knife deeper into her chest. And it's just, like, it's so over the top, but it's, I don't know, that I think that's probably my favorite death, because it's just, it's so brutal and real and unexpected. And, again, you're, like, watching everything. You're like, oh, my God, this is dripping on that. What's she going to, you know? And so, I don't know, they just do a really good job of setting up that dread feeling. Oh, God. Okay, so the fourth death, Sean William Scott, shout out to our Minnesota hometown boy, another hometown boy. You think that it's going to be fine, this train is going by, and then he gets decapitated by the stray sheet metal. Yeah, that, because you're like, okay, and it's kind of, you're coming down from that, like, you know, anxiety of, like, okay, nobody got hit by the train, and then, and then the sheet metal just straight up takes his head off, and so... And, you know, and, and there's something really real and brutal about it because, I mean, people do die from stuff like that. I mean, so when I hear about deaths like that, too, I'm like, oh, it's so Final Destination when, like, somebody gets killed. Like, um, somebody got killed by an elevator or an escalator or something like that. I'm like, oh, my God, you know? Yeah, it's it's icky and it's scary. It's making me paranoid. Speaking of paranoid, he's um, – Devin Sawa's character is staying in this cabin now because – uh, realistically the cops are like okay what's going on did he know something and all these people around him are dying now and uh, so he's staying in this cabin and like he's trying to cover everything that could possibly kill him and things are still not great like he almost gets hooked by a rusty hook and he's like oh tetanus you know <laughs> whatever I, I think that that's a really good setup and and the whole climax in the movie too like he and these other two people like do escape death but but they actually don't yeah, I mean, and and I like Clear, I think her name is, um, and this whole idea, too, of now that he comes out of the cabin and he goes and realizes she's next and everything, um, and then we have that whole sequence with the dog and the electricity and everything, um, I sort of like her background story of, like, her parents dying and how she's like, you know, you don't, you don't, when you're a kid, you worry about that happening all the time, I know I did, but it doesn't happen, but for some people it does, and so she kind of talks about that that sort of reality and, like, the way she sees death is different and stuff like that. So I thought I thought they did a good job of, like, making her a fully realized character and in, in what could be a really shallow teen movie if they wanted it to be. Yeah. Uh, they They survive. They go to Paris together six months later. But then, of course, we get this end sequence, and, well, we find out in the sequel, um, she survived, and I think, oh, he did for a little while, but... Isn't, isn't she, like, in a, a mental hospital or something like that? Yeah, and she, it, like, checked herself in, and she doesn't want to check out, because okay. she's in a white padded room, because oh. it's to keep her safe. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating, too, because what, if you're in that situation... Do you want to live in a white padded room? Do you want to just get out and, like, accept what's going to happen to you? I don't know. I mean, that's really scary. But she does die in the second one, doesn't she? Yeah, she does. Okay. You're going to talk about this with Campbell, so yeah. I won't. But I've, I've seen a couple of the sequels. I don't think I've seen all of them. So I'm, I'm going to listen to what you and Campbell say because you got, I've got to find out which ones I should rewatch. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you right off the bat, I think you should watch all of them because we had a great time. Watch them in order. That's important. And I, I, uh, there is a spoiler coming up. So, so listen to what Campbell and I have to say. Here we go. So I am here with Campbell and we watched all five Final Destination movies over a weekend because they were, we found them all available on various streaming services and that was a really fun weekend yeah it, it was a really fun weekend now campbell hadn't seen any of them before this rewatch that i did the first one i was like oh you definitely have to watch this with me because i think you'll get a kick out of it so what were your impressions about the first movie so just to recap remember this is like the initial flight 180 uh, that he has the premonition 
that it's going to crash and then death comes to get him. Uh, yeah, I really liked it. Um, it was the first movie, so I didn't really know about the whole thing where, like, they imagine and everything comes true up to a certain point. So I found that really cool. Then I found out that it happens again, and it's still cool. Uh, and then a cool scene was, like, when they were arguing, and then Flight 180 explodes in the background. Yeah, that was pretty powerful. Because at that point, you know, you're not really sure if it's just sort of in his mind and what's going to happen. Now, the the second movie, the fi- Final Destination 2, came out in 2003. It's 48% on Rotten Tomatoes. And the premise for this one is a traffic accident. The girl is in the car and she imagines this major traffic accident beginning with uh, this logging truck that is on the road and some logs fall off. Uh, I think a chain is is dragging behind and that makes some sparks. So there's a, a sheriff's car involved and some other cars. What else do you remember or what else did you like about Final Destination 2? Um, yeah, so that beginning scene was really good. I kind of like the thing how then death was going backwards because in her vision they and her friends died last, but then they and her friends died uh, first, or, no, there's the friends died first, and then I like how during kind of, like, the, there's that one scene where the guy's trying to kill himself, and then, like, all six bullets are blanks, because it isn't his turn to die, his turn to die. Yes, that was so great, I forgot about that, that it was in, death was going in reverse, uh, the reverse order because of how the vision worked out. And it was fun. Um, one of our current watches that we just finished, One Day at a Time, which RIP, I hope, uh, it just got canceled, but I hope another network picks it up by the time this episode airs. Um, but Justina Mikado, who plays Penelope on One Day at a Time, she is the pregnant woman in uh, this movie. So that was fun. Yeah, and I, I also like how they're trying to save her because they think... She's gonna die, and they say like new life, like a new life will defeat death. So that, so then like they save her, and she has the baby, but then uh, she has the vision, a certain part of the vision again, and she realizes that she doesn't die in the traffic accident. So then she realizes that she has to kind of like drive the car into the lake, and have Doctor Kalarjan revive her. Yeah, so she actually has to die, and then the new life is her coming back to life. But I don't think it has a happy ending anyway, because, like, something bad is about to happen at the end. That's what I love about these movies. It's like, just when you think it's all solved, it's not really. They talk, yeah, so what happened was earlier, there was, like, this crash. Like, the uh, the news van was about to, uh, like, run over this kid. So then, like, one guy pulled him out of the way, then he died a few minutes later. And then at the end of the movie, um... They're at, like, a barbecue with their house, and then they said that he survived, and then in the background, like, the barbecue thing blows up that he's at, and then it ends with, like, the mom screaming, and then his arm lands on her plate. Oh, God. Yes, it's so terrible and horrific, but there's such a sense of fun to these movies, and I know maybe only demented horror fans can appreciate that I don't know maybe that makes it wrong but these deaths I mean how people die it's so clever and you know like the final destination theme is that it's this impossible way that just everything comes together perfectly because death has to catch up to you and so it's just I I don't know I just I enjoy it the third movie Final Destination 3 came out in 2006, and it's 43% on Rotten Tomatoes. This is the one with the premise of the roller coaster death. And so this is also the one where they are going around and they are looking at the photos because they believe the photos of the people before the roller the roller coaster crash, it's revealing how they're going to die. Yeah, uh, and then I really like the roller coaster crash scene. And I really like the premise of it, like, some guy's camera falls on the track, and that creates, like, I don't really know how it works. Like, they ran over the camera, something happened. Yeah, like, the then the, the wheels went off the tracks because of that, and there were already a couple, like, screws loose, and so it was just a series of, oh, yeah, and then, remember, there was, like, it, like, short-circuited, and their 
safety harnesses like came undone and people were like literally hanging on to the roller coaster as it was going upside down and stuff oh that's so good yeah i really liked it and then how like the two girls just like fell and then another person yeah like they all fell and i feel like one of them like fell into a spike or something oh yeah that was it was horrific it was bad and like the one guy it's like oh well he he fell he's you know it's gonna be bad but then he like hit something on the way down it's pretty horrific it's pretty gross um i think this is the one when death catches up with those girls that you mentioned there is this one where they're in the tanning booth yeah it's the one in the tanning booth that death i it sticks out in my mind because everything just perfectly works out and they're getting cooked alive and it's just so gross it's so bad but um i i liked the third one yeah i i really liked the third one it was a good it was good now, the one um, that is the lowest rated on Rotten Tomatoes is Final Destination 4. It came out in 2009, and the premise for this one is a, they're at a NASCAR race, and a crash goes horribly wrong, and tires and cars and debris fly into the stands, and then the stands start to fall, and all of these people die. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the fourth? Oh, uh, Yeah. The fourth was a really good movie. Also, I just remembered this. Uh, in the movie, there's, like, little references to, like, Flight 180. Because in, like, the fourth movie, they're sending in Row 180. This one had also, like, it was set... I don't know if it was set in the South or if it just sort of had that vibe because of the NASCAR thing. But there was the guy who was, like, a big racist. And then he was, like... Wasn't he trying to, like, go burn a cross on somebody's lawn and then he died? Oh, yeah, that was a really funny thing. Like, he was trying to go burn a cross on some... A uh, person of color's uh, yard, and then like something happened, like he set himself on fire, and then like something fell, so it was like like slowly dragging him down the street on fire. Yeah, so you know he was a terrible character, and he sort of got what was coming to him. Uh, there, I think this one, you know, probably of the five, I I see that it's rated the lowest, and it probably was my least favorite of the five, but. I still enjoyed watching it. I still thought it was... It's just fun to see how death is going to get everybody. Yeah, it, it's really fun. Now, the fifth movie came out in 2011, and it is 62% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I can't remember if I saw this or if I had started it um, and, and wasn't able to finish it, but the premise for this one, it's a bridge collapse. They are on this charter bus coach bus going to a work retreat and all of these things happen there's construction going on the bridge and this bridge ends up collapsing and um, all these people die of course the guy has the vision and you know gets his friends out of there but death still comes for them oh you know what i need to go back the the fourth movie had that scene of the guy getting disemboweled by the pool and that happens a lot in real life and it happened not that long ago right here in minnesota yeah it did it's so sad and uh be careful of pool drains people that's dangerous apparently so this bridge collapse one i mean do you remember any of the other deaths in it or should i talk about the twist i remember one of the deaths is, like, there's the sexist guy, and then he's in, like, a room, and then, like, something starts on fire, and he has, like, all these, like, needles poking into him. Oh, yeah, acupuncture. And then he, like, falls off the bed, and they all impale him, and then he's, like, trying to get him out. And then, like, some, like, something, sp like, flammable spills, a thing falls, and then he, like, slips on it, and then, like, a statue of Buddha falls on his head. Yeah, so, oh gosh, it's so clever. I just love it. Now, spoiler alert. I mean, we've we've sort of talked about spoilers throughout this episode, but if you haven't seen the fifth one, there's a, I'm about to rele reveal a major spoiler. And if you don't want to know, then you should stop listening because I encourage you to go and watch the fifth one. If you're like, oh, uh, I saw the first and the second one or whatever, and I don't know what other one to watch, I think you should watch the fifth one. It's a lot of fun, and here comes the spoiler. It's actually a prequel. It blew my mind because they subtly, you know, this is 11 years before 
the the first one came out, you know, supposedly, they subtly were able to leave out all of the things that made us see that it was it was back in that era in time and we didn't notice that oh my gosh, this is actually a prequel to Flight 180. Flight 180 happens in the final scene of this movie. It blew me away. Yeah, and then how the people who survived get on Flight 180 and then they see like the fight that happened in the first movie when the kid was trying to get everyone off the plane. Ugh. Yes, it's so crazy. And then it's like, holy crap, okay, they die on this plane and now this is this was actually the prequel all along. I freaking loved it. Also, like, the fourth one is called The Final Destination. So, technically, the fourth one is The Final Destination because it happens last. Oh, my gosh. You're so right. That's true. So, I I cannot um, tell you how much I enjoy these. I mean, I, I guess I can tell you because I enjoyed them a lot. But I just thought, what a fun weekend. And... It just like even to this day, this was a this was a few weeks ago now that we did this. Even still today, we'll notice something like either Campbell or I and we'll be like, oh, this is like a final destination moment. Like there's going to be a giant icicle falling off of the garage roof and impaling me or, oh, no, there's a logging truck in front of us. Like everything that I'm seeing, it's like, how is death going to get us? Yeah, it's sort of dark. I'm sorry. I hope I haven't warped your brain. No, I don't think you have. <laughs> any other uh, memorable death sequences that you remember through of any of the, the two through five movies? Uh, another memorable one I think of is when they're in that warehouse, like the hardware store and the, the nail gun. That in particular is pretty horrific. Uh, what other ones do you remember? I don't remember if it's in the sec. I think it's in the second one, uh, where it's like, yeah, it is the second one where it's like the guy wins the lottery and then he goes home, and then like a magnet falls into his Chinese food as he's as in the microwave, and like a fire starts, and then like he goes down the emergency ladder thing, and he has like a nipple ring. So I'm so <laughs> my mom and I were really scared. Well, yeah, you're like, oh, no, this is something hor- horrible is going to happen. But then the ladder ends up, like, impaling him in the in the head, and he dies. But then he's at the morgue, and they... Did they tear out his nipple ring? Yeah, they tear out his... <laughs> I don't think they show it. Like, he's just holding on to it. Then it makes, like, the sound of tearing out the nipple ring. Oh, God. But, you know, that's the other thing they do a good job of in these movies, is they show you all of these possible things that... Like, you're primed and ready for, like, oh, well, is this going to come into play? Um, and sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't, but it just keeps you on the edge of your seat. And, you know, there's some some jump scares and things, and so it's not all uh, just gore, but, you know, there is that gore or that that shock factor and just that anticipation. I think that's my, my favorite part of these films. And then at the end of, it's either the third one or the fourth one? I don't remember, um, but it's like they're sitting at the cafe window and like when and the main character says, "What if this was death's intention all along?" And then like a garbage truck, like so then there was construction across the street, and then like this ladder fell and it was like moving this dumpster into the way. So then this garbage truck like swerved around it, then it like, crashed in, and then during like the credits. It showed, like, them as, like, their skeletons, like, being crushed and, like, flying into walls and stuff. Yes, two of the movies used an animated sequence of showing, like, the skeletons of the people and, like, what death did to to the crush them. And, like, that's, it's gory, yet it's fascinating. It's more of, like, a scientific approach. And, oh, I just, I love those credit sequences. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're showing it. It's... It's pretty great. Another memorable death, I think this is in the second one. Remember they were in the drive-thru lane and that guy ends up getting decapitated? Oh, yeah. Also, I remembered another one from the fifth one. It was like the the gymnastics death where it's like she was on the pole. Then there was like too much stuff, so she went flying. And then like the bone was sticking out of her leg. And the thing was that like when we were watching it, like the TV was... Like, like, 
it would play a commercial, but then, like, the movie would be playing in the same time. So then it went from, like, the girl that, like, stepped on the thing to just showing her, like, there. Oh, all twisted and, and broken. And that's another example of anticipation. They had a little screw, like, that had fallen off of something on the balance beam. And so the entire time they're showing that and she's barefoot and she's doing all these moves but that's not what gets her. And it's just like, oh, you're just waiting for it. And then uh, we kept on saying that, like, the person doing the subtitles was drunk because, like, every once in a while, like, the sub, like, the words would be in, like, Chinese or something. And then, like, the box would be way too big. Like, one time they just, it was like the subtitles were as high and the box took up the entire screen. Yeah, it was very strange. I think that one was on demand on DirecTV. So what are you doing, DirecTV? Go home, you're drunk. Well, I I love the this film series. It's It feels close to my heart because it was, you know, started off with these uh, this X-Files connection. And so I would recommend going go and, and watch these movies if you have a chance. It's a fun uh, little binge watch. And, you know... It's not going to change the world, but it might change the way you look at the world. Yeah. So let's rank the first Final Destination movie on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 being you hated it, 10 being you think it's a perfect movie. How many? Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. What's our scale? I just keep thinking Rocky Mountain High. But that's not really. <laughs> well, John, how about John Denver Records? Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's some old school references. I mean, it's not old school then because in 2000 there were VHS tapes and physical newspapers. But I was like, oh, look at that stuff. It's like ancient history. But how about John Denver on vinyl? Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> how many do you give Final Destination? I give Final Destination seven and a half. I think it's a good movie. I think that the performances are pretty good. Um, I think that it has some scary moments and some dread moments. But at the same time, you know, it's not like a, a horror masterpiece or anything. That's true. I, I'm giving it an eight because I really enjoyed it. And it's fun to watch how every single death plays out and how like they've written it to make it just perfect. And I think they up the ante in, in some of the sequels with complicated death sequences, which that's great. I mean, sometimes you just see somebody come out and slash, slash somebody's throat in these horror movies. And that's fun too. But having these complicated deaths just brings it to a, a whole other level. Well, and also deaths that are more likely to happen to us. I mean, like I've never, I don't like um, escalators and I don't like elevators. And so I know there's one with an elevator and I know like, they're just, there are things that are more, and I'm not saying that being like um, bisected by an elevator is going to happen to you, <laughs> but I'm just saying there's more likely that you're going to have some sort of accident like that than somebody's going to come out and slight, slice your throat, you know? So there is that parano paranoia that these movies can kind of give you. Yes. Now, every time I see a logging truck because of one of the sequels, I'm just like, oh my God, what if that fell off and came through my windshield? Yeah, I mean, I've seen, like, you know, like, old Rescue 911s about people where something, like, went through them as they were driving and stuff. Or it happens to Carrie Elvis and Twister. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> if it happened to Carrie Elvis, it can happen to anyone. I think we all know. Oh, well, yeah, so go go watch these movies. I was able to find um, some on Netflix, and then the rest were on demand on my cable provider, which is DirecTV. Shout out. <laughs> Are you trying to get, like, free? Yeah. Okay, Send me yeah. swag. <laughs> Direct TV hat. Yeah, I'll wear it. I don't care. I'm not so proud. <laughs> we hope that you're having a great week, uh, listeners, and just be careful out there. Like, be safe. Don't let a final destination death happen to you. And just, like, go sit on the toilet before you get on the airplane. Oh, yeah. I think that's great advice from his, his BF. And he was in uh, an X-Files episode, too, remember? Oh. Is he hungry, guy? And um, his dad is Robert Patrick Modell from um, Pusher. There you go. I literally just said all three of his names because I guess that's like in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I, I love all the X-Files people and all the X-Files references. And Kristen Cloak, the teacher, is married to Glenn Morgan. So that's kind of cute. And yeah, there's just an X-Files feel to it. And those guys need to make more movies. What are they up to? I know. I 
I love it. And speaking of Man in the High Castle, that's another X Files tie in. Frank Spotnitz is running that show. Oh, I didn't realize that. I've got to watch it because, you know, I mentioned I've, I've read the book and it's a cool, like, I like the alternate history idea. That's cool. You know, it's, it, yeah, it's fascinating. I, I recommend it. So until next time, we'll see you in the horror section.